the brain and the motor output happening in your hand or your fingers. Um, so people also often talk about a smudging that occurs in the part of your brain that has to do with fine motor skills for your hand. Mm -hmm. And as musicians, we spend hours and hours and hours working on fine motor control, precision and detailed movement, right? That is what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, and when our neuroplasticity that helps us learn those skills kind of goes wrong and goes a little bit haywire, instead of telling my fingers to put one finger down, it was unsure and so four fingers would go down. So literally that disconnect between what's happening yeah. up here and what's coming out in. in and uh, so this, this started video. kind of the set in, in round two, this mostly started to come up. And so I'm curious in coming out of round one, like when you came back into it, sorry, I'm, I'm calling it rounds. No, please. But, um, <laughs> So what did you discover and like what sort of changes did you implement? And obviously it wasn't enough to kind of solve everything and all these new things started, but kind of what, what, what did you change? And like, did you figure out what the source of it was? Um, I'm, I'm curious. Like coming yeah, out of uh, one. That was, it was challenging. I had not been someone that people looked at normally and said, wow, she plays with a lot of tension or wow, there's something. Drastic. I never noticed that about you. Like I would have never said you played with yeah. tension. And that that's something yeah. I've noticed as well in, in musicians, like that sometimes the ones that don't look like they're tense are up. So you have to come up and like feel their hand and, you know, teachers do or should do that. And, but yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, you know, and it's something that I've talked with my husband a lot about mm -hmm. as well. And I would have him just like look at me because and, and watch me play. And I'd have a lot of different people come in, just watch me play. And I was like, is there anything that you see? You know, like mm -hmm. rack your brain. Is there anything weird that you're seeing here? Um, I think one of the most important things I learned that first round was the importance of breathing while playing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I am a huge advocate for <laughs> learning how to breathe, understanding what you're doing with your breath when you're playing um, and it may be different to what you think you're doing with your breath when you're playing as well so one of the things that i knew was like oh i cue a lot with breath when i mm. play right let's say we're doing chamber music or something and right and you do that short quick breath and mm -hmm. that is absolutely like a, a chest breath right that's coming from like your the upper part of your breathing abilities in your body and it's also like increasing tension immediately in your neck you're using accessory breathing muscles, which I know now, um, I but already that's like priming you for maybe a little bit more tension when you play that first note. Um, I was realizing that I was only pretty much breathing in my chest and that was contributing to a lot of the tension uh, that I was having in some of my upper neck muscles and my chest muscles, which was sort of causing the thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, so that was a huge, a huge thing for me to learn about. Was so breathing from the chest as opposed to kind of breathing from lower or. Yeah. Kind of using, using your whole body's capability of breathing, right? So yeah. that's using your diaphragm, using your whole rib cage, um, and just giving some of these small muscles in your neck and chest, like a little bit of a break sometimes, right? right? Like let's use all the, all the room that we have to breathe. Um, and I think that has an effect uh, physically, right, on how much muscle tension we play with, but also on our nervous systems. So when we breathe up here and when we breathe faster, it activates our like flight or fight response, right? It's that sympathetic yes. nervous system. If we can breathe more deeply um, and into our diaphragm, we can actually activate that calming system, that parasympathetic nervous system, mm -hmm. to help us deal with those feelings of performance anxiety that we might have as we're as we're on stage too. So, lots of things from that. Well, I think th this is what some athletes and like even extreme athletes do to like lower their heart rate, or mm -hmm. you know, to exactly what you said to, to the, the fight or flight response. Like, how do we counter that and yeah, breathing and heart rate. The problem with some of that is I feel like, and I'm better at, at this than I used to be, but when the fight or flight is already there and there's already enough chemistry in your system, like it's really hard to come down from that. Like if you haven't primed yourself and you haven't like, you know, you're there and now it's like, oh crap, I got to breathe. I got to start breathing. <laughs> and I almost feel like, it, oh, it's too late. <laughs> 
There, there's definitely a piece to that. Um, and right, it doesn't mean that we want to get rid of it entirely, right? Like yes. a little bit of that is great. That's probably what makes makes us performers, right? We sort of like that rush, right? Um, but absolutely, the cycle that can happen when when we feel like we can't control maybe our heart rate or our breathing or the physical symptoms maybe yes. from some of that uh, adrenaline response can be can be scary. Something else I noticed, you were talking about breathing. Um, what I realized when I did a little bit of studying about this is like, when you breathe out, um, technically it shouldn't require any muscles to, to a certain point because there's tension and and like it just deflates. And this was very helpful for me. Like I used to think breathing in and breathing out are both like actions that require mm -hmm. A, a sort of a conscious, a conscious action, but just that realizing that I can lower everything here on a breath out, and that to some extent most of the air will be expelled just by a feeling of release. Um, that was that was helpful for me personally. Absolutely, yeah. I think going along with that too, it's like what positions are conducive to being able to breathe comfortably mm. and uh, can we maybe warm up some of those positions or like be in some of those positions more often during the day to help ourselves be able to to breathe better when it really matters right when we are in that performance mode yeah yeah good point so yeah. kind of continuing with your story so yeah. we're at we're at round two and things are things are heating up and they're not, not <laughs> going <are> well. <laughs> um, yeah, so at this point, I'm still in Chicago, um, trying to make it through juries at the end of <laughs> uh, at the end of this process. And uh, my teacher's aware of everything that's going on. He doesn't really know what to do. No one really knows what to do. Um, I think I was I was definitely a little more scared at that point too. Again the idea of having this all happen again and having to try and build back yeah. up to this and like another time just felt felt like a big task to to take on um but ultimately i took a medical leave of absence from the program it was decided that i just really i shouldn't be there and i couldn't really be there and participate so i went home to california um and again really thankful for the support of my family during that time and my dad's connections to uh, some really great physical therapists. So we put together like a little pro PT team. So at one point I was seeing three different PTs. Uh, one was a certified hand therapist. One was specialized in thoracic outlet syndrome and had a whole um, niche way of treating this. And then the other one was Nancy Bill and she's um, actually one of the instructors for my PT program that I ended up going to at UCSF. And she was doing a lot of research at the time on focal dystonia for musicians. And so mm -hmm. she had seen this before and she was working with this and she just knew a lot about it. Um, I was also seeing a neurologist and a pain specialist at the same time. So we kind of put together this little treatment team um, uh, to see where this could go. So started kind of a, a different rehab approach to some things and um, yeah, started learning a lot about my body. Um, and this is one of the things that I just think physical therapists are really good at in general is providing that education, right? this is your body, this is what's happening. And you, you are the one that has the tools to, to eventually get better, right? Mm -hmm. This is an active process. And so they really had to get me to buy into that. Like, okay, if I want to do this, I need to put in so much work and so much focus into making this happen. Um, so yeah, so I was out there for a while. Um, I still in the back of my head was like, okay, three months later, that was the the period of time that I had for this leave of absence. So there was still a timeline on it. And it was like three months later, I'm gonna come back to school and I'm gonna be ready to roll. And mm. I'm gonna be like ready for my senior year, right? Yeah. Um, and that just wasn't gonna happen. This was gonna be a lengthy rehab process. And ultimately I think at, at the time I never wanted to give up that dream, right? But uh, it ended up being the right move for sure. And it was heartbreaking and devastating. But when I took that pressure off of having that timeline on my recovery, then I could actually start focusing on what the things were that were really needed to be my priorities, right? Like my, I was not functional, right? I was in pain all the time. My hand wasn't working properly. 
lots of things were going wrong. And it was like, let's take out the fact that you really want to play Haydn Concerto in three months and like focus for real and, and change the priorities. That seems so, like a, a, yeah. a common problem that like, how do you balance goals that you have, you know, maybe short term or medium term goals with kind of the, the kind of space and attention that's required to solve solve issues like that and you know maybe for many people they have like let's say smaller problems but are still problems and could become bigger problems um and yet they're trying to stay you know keep up with their schedule um yeah i'm wondering do you have any yeah like any advice to people that have to balance that like should you be ready to and not be afraid to kind of cancel some things that you think are important, but relative to what your problems can become are not so important. I don't know. Yeah, uh, it's such a big topic, such a big It's very question. personal, of course. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think it's gonna be different for every person in every situation. Um, I do think, again, if you can catch something early on and you can address it or find an intervention that works for you mm -hmm. earlier rather than later is always going to be better, right? If you can yeah. learn the tools before you're at the point where you have to stop playing, mm -hmm. like that it's going to bode so much better for your recovery, right? And I've talked to you about this too, Dan, yes. right? If you have something that's been building slowly and it doesn't make you stop playing, but it's there, right? And it's been there for a really long period of time don't let that catch up to you, right? We have to knit those things um, and we have to get resources and tools to be able to work with them, right? And it doesn't mean that you're gonna go to maybe a physical therapist or another provider and they're gonna say, stop playing, right? It's not yeah. It's not necessarily gonna be career ending, right? This was, again, in my situation too, it was like a choice I made because I didn't, I didn't have time really yeah. to recover and be able to get back to school, right? So. Um, there are options out there. For well, you the problem also is that there's all yeah. complacency. Like at a certain mm -hmm. point, I there's certain, various problems I had. I thought it was at a, at a certain point. I just began to think, okay, well, it's normal to have this amount of pain or this amount of constant kind of some, yeah. something bothering me, and and then maybe even I learned how to deal with it, kind of band aid. Mm -hmm. Put, put a Band-Aid on it, but not really solve it. And so that's, um, I think that's what you're getting at in terms of just catching things early and that, yeah. And once I got out of that cycle and kind of went to kind of first principles of what is actually happening in the body and like that was that was really, I was like, wow, I'm glad I didn't keep, keep on that path of just like com complacency and like it'll solve itself or like it's okay, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think uh, it can be maybe a little more scary because it takes more time, right, to really take a look at what what the driving force may be in terms mm -hmm. of causing some of these things, right? So we're always going to want to do that quick fix thing, right? Yeah. We're going to want to put a Band-Aid on it, do a, you know, a massage every couple of months just to keep your body feeling like you can do what you need to do but like do you really feel well is this sustainable right. right and really it takes more time and energy i think to kind of dig down to the root of the cause sometimes um but it can be really important to do so i used to go and maybe i told you this i used to go to this um acupressure like a chinese medicine guy in chinatown in boston this was my like my band-aid because it really felt better but didn't really solve problems but every time i came to him he's like he asked me, <clears throat> he wanted me to remind him how old I am. And he was like, how old you are? And I'm like, I was 35 at the time. He's like, mm, you very young, body very old. <laughs> I'm like, okay, nice to see you too, sensei. Um, or yes. rather, Sifu. But no, I mean, the, the amount of stress that we put on our bodies physically and on our minds mentally as musicians, I think is something that's entirely overlooked, right? Yeah. We were having this conversation, right? When you were here um, about the fact that we, like musicians are athletes, right? Yep. Using oftentimes like smaller muscles 
but using them longer throughout the day than maybe like your your professional athletes would mm -hmm. right and we need to think of ourselves as that so that we do invest the time and energy into caring for our bodies as much as we do in terms of caring for your instrument right like you take your instrument in for tune-ups you change it out different ways for seasons right you get these different things and we should really be considering our bodies too can we keep our bodies healthy and maintain for our current performance season or for the seasons and years ahead as well and it's just unfortunately not seen like that uh always right now i think it's growing um yeah the, the awareness of it is growing yeah it's definitely something i've seen i've seen more of and that's been a, a relief to see the, the growing interest in that and um so kind of uh, dovetailing off of that if someone doesn't really know where to start, if someone doesn't know much about the, the physiology and doesn't have much knowledge about this, but maybe is experiencing problems, like where would you recommend they start to, to really investigate this? And uh, whether it's kind of a information, but also kind of self inquiry, just how, how does someone go about that? Yeah, Besides seeing um, a PT, yeah. <laughs> which well, maybe should we make a disclaimer now? Like this is not financial advice, uh, medical or financial advice. Correct. This is not medical and financial advice. However, I am happy to be a resource yes. um, for people. And I'll put my contact info out there at the end. Absolutely. Too, so uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, yes. So I think maybe two different parts of your, of your thought here. So I think if you're someone who is experiencing symptoms that you haven't maybe experienced before or you're wondering if you should go see someone because maybe you're having some soreness or you're having some tightness or some pain or some numbness and tingling whatever it is and say again please reach out to someone and and try to find a physical therapist a, a different kind of healthcare provider whoever you would normally go and see um <clears throat> excuse me and hi, yeah if you're someone that um is investing in your body and you want to learn more about your own anatomy right i think that's fantastic i think this is something that maybe at some point we consider teaching in music conservatory programs right mm -hmm. we should learn about our bodies so we can keep them healthy and strong for the career that is ahead of you because you have to use your body every single day and you want to keep it optimally performing all the time um so yeah i do have a fun little thing to share here uh one of the things i love using with my patients um, is this app called Essential Anatomy. And sorry, give me a second here. Um, but I think it's really helpful just to get a feeling for what exactly is under our skin, right? What is our body dealing with? How is it that we can do all the amazing things that we're doing with our bodies um, when we're doing them? And how are all of these things connected as well? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm technologically challenged here. Okay, great. Can you see this, Dan? Yep. Okay. So this is right. The human body without skin on it. Um, it, that's how I look in the morning. <laughs> I <figured. laughs> um, like so I think there's a lot of things here. Um, and again, this is not to, to teach anyone specifics about anatomy or anything like that, but I do think it's important to know how these things are connected. Right. Mm -hmm. So just taking a quick scan here, right. What we see on the outside, is muscles normally there's layers of fascia on top of that that kind of are a cobweb material that covers everything um muscles right we have tons and tons of them in our body and they are layered on top of each other so all of our muscles right allow us to do different actions so um dan what's something you have to do every day as you play the violin like show me something well so one of the one of the things we deal with a lot and as you know is just how we conceptualize holding the instrument like is this a clamp or is the violin resting and like mm -hmm. you know how is the head interacting with the violin so all those things so naturally a lot of the neck muscles here um yeah and then sh yeah. shoulder and well, everything on this side yeah absolutely right so as as violinists as string players in general i think we think a lot right about what are our neck and shoulders and arms and hands doing? Yes. Um, so again, there are tons of muscles that help you do those things every day. As violinists, right, you are oftentimes kind of in this position here, right? As Dan said, like 
are we clamping down on the chin rest or what are we doing here? Yes. And that is really going to be so different, right? For every single person's body. And this is why treatment also of these things. Um, and I would say like violin positioning, right? And cello positioning too, for that matter, has to be individualized for, for everyone's different, different body type, right? Because our necks are all different sizes. <laughs> um, so I was always uh, just, jealous of people with no neck. <laughs> That's my husband too, right? Yes. <laughs> and like, I, I would right. not have been a, a good violinist. I, right? Like my neck is so, so long, right? So like, this is this gets really challenging. And especially if you have teachers then, right? I've heard through the grapevine that there's methodologies that maybe don't allow you to use uh, shoulder rests or- There's a lot of dogma. Yes, yes, there's a lot of dogma at the expense of many people whose names you don't, you, you hear about the people for whom it worked out but right. There's... And you don't hear about it for, for people like my husband who was told to stop playing with a shoulder rest. And he has a neck that's longer than mine. And his fourth and fifth fingers went numb for months. And so he said, screw that. I'm going to find a different way to do yeah. this. And um, what he did to combat that was get a giant chin rest. <laughs> did you? I uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember that. He uh, inspired <laughs> me also to, to try the giant chin rest. Yeah, right. To, like something, right, to help fill in this gap because, yeah. like, this is a really awkward and uncomfortable position that no one should be in for multiple hours a day. But, yes. anyways, so, um, yeah, we have tons of layers of neck muscles here, right, that connect from our skull down into our spine, down into our shoulders, right? And just to give you an example here of some of them, so I'm just going to kind of mm -hmm. go layer by layer here. Um, so if we get rid of that one, right, we start seeing the cervical spine, which is where what attaches the head to kind of the shoulder area here. Mm -hmm. um, and all of those muscles here that help to support our head and neck, right, we can continue to hide more and hide more. Um, and all of the yellow things that we see here as well are the nerves, right? So our nerves start up in our head and neck here in our spinal cord and they travel all the way down the body and it's really important to kind of remember that uh as we think about where could those things maybe get stuck or get mm -hmm. entrapped right or how um how is the pain in my hand maybe actually related to something that's happening in my neck yes. right so when you go to a physical therapist or maybe if you're seeking out treatment you might be really confused at first because i'm looking at how your neck's moving, how your back's moving, how your shoulder's moving, how your shoulder blade is moving. Is your is your collarbone moving? Is your rib cage moving, right? Looking at all of these things because there's a regional interdependence to how all of those things work together to allow you to move in the best way possible. Um, yeah, I don't know. This this app is pretty fun though. So I think it really gives gives people a better understanding of how these things are all connected and again what's underneath all of them as well, right? So we have tons of uh muscles that go from our head right down the spine and then continue on down. Oh boy, hold on. Let's there we go. Um all the way down the back, right, into mm -hmm. into our pelvis. So um one of the things I sometimes talk to my husband about is right, is core stability and core mm. strength, right? Which is maybe not something we think a lot about as musicians. We're like, well, I'm an orchestral musician. I sit and I really just need my arms and my shoulders to be able to do what I need to do, right? And it's like, well, what's holding you up, right? Well, you do have legs. We do have legs as musicians. Um, and oftentimes people are able to stand and play and that's great too. But how are we really supporting ourselves to be able to do and move in the way that we want to want to move and again that's all um a combination of movements between the shoulder blade the shoulder the arm the neck um just the whole spine and the core together so so the, the core strength so is that a matter of doing some specific you know core strength exercises or and or um just having that awareness that something is holding you up rather than carrying so much here and also kind of just posture while sitting you know that that's something i uh we've talked about before and it's just something i've thought about a lot um doing alexander technique and just i've had a lot of problems with that and just maybe we can get into that a bit like sitting and then how core muscles play into that and yeah absolutely um 
again, really big topic. And I, I yeah. don't really want to give specific exercises on this yes. again, because I do think it's so individualized for, for, for each person. Um, but yeah, maybe a, a conversation for another time too, we could do one on therapy. But in terms exercise. of sitting, like maybe we could just talk about sitting <laughs> yeah. a bit, like, I think there are some misconceptions about sitting and like what, what is good posture and um, how that plays into sitting when you're playing and i um, curious what, what you've gathered. Obviously cellists sit more than anyone else. We do, we do sit a lot. Um, I think a couple things there, um, chairs, right? We all know we can't always choose them as musicians, you show up to a gig or you show up to your orchestra rehearsal and, and the chair is sometimes what it is. I think uh, something I've learned from my husband is that you can actually sometimes choose your chair mm. as an orchestral musician and he brings that chair everywhere. He so sees he Glenn Gould, that, basically. <laughs> yeah, so he, he found one that worked really well for him. Again, because everyone's legs are going to be different lengths, right? They have, Chairs have different amounts of support, whether you're someone that needs to sit all the way back in a chair, right? To actually have your back like touching mm. the chair. So you have a little more support there. Um, or someone who sits way up at the front, right? Depending on your body, it might be a little bit different. Um, I think with orchestral musicians, right? It gets a little bit more tricky too because of where you are in the orchestra and how you have to face or how you have to navigate um, depending on your stand partner, depending on how, how to see who you need to see, right? There's so many factors yeah. there. Um, but I think ultimately with just some sort of basic principles, right? If we can sit with our feet firmly planted on the floor is always <laughs> um, a really good place to start, right? Give yourself that foundation. If that input is there, we can kind of build up from there. Um, if we can sit in a way that's comfortable also for our pelvis. So you think of like, okay, let's maybe try and relatively stack your shoulders, right? Kind of over your hips. And you can all even try it right now as we're doing this. Mm -hmm. um, we talk in PT sometimes about like the pelvis, right? Is kind of mobile. It moves forward, it moves back, it tilts. Right. And mm -hmm. if we can find kind of a neutral position between really being tilted forward, like you feel like you're going to fall forward and tilted back, like you're kind of slumping down, mm -hmm. that finding that neutral can sometimes be helpful for people. Um, that can also allow us to optimally engage our belly muscles um, because then we're kind of we're aligned in a, in a slightly better, better way, too. I see. Um, of course, it's interesting, right? Because with violinists, especially, I think you are in an asymmetrical position just by the nature of the instrument, right? So I think we will oftentimes see maybe different things happening um, injury-wise down the road or just like things that have happened because you've played for so long, right? From one side to the other side is going to look really different just because yeah. postural, you are asymmetrical. That's what you have to do. Yeah. So in terms of sitting, just one thing I was thinking about is like, before I started investigating, I had this idea of like how you're supposed to sit. And mm -hmm. I used to even get this advice of like, I mean, it's obviously one of the options, like sit in the front of the chair with like a straight back. And like, mm. I have this image of that as the correct way to sit. And um, I mean, what I learned, at least for myself, was that it, it while that is a valid way to sit, it, it just trying to maintain that all the time it caused caused issues so yeah i mean yeah. obviously as you said like different bodies sit differently but what's your experience with kind of either for yourself or for the musicians you worked with just kind of instructing them on on um how they conceptualize sitting in, in that way mm. yeah so I, I really like those thoughts i think we can't ever think that there's going to be one position where we have to be rigid and stay there forever, right? Just the, the basis of sustaining positions and sustain trying to sustain postures for too long is also like unhealthy for our body, right? Your, yeah. your muscles will have to work so hard to keep yourself erect, right? And so that's not necessarily what we want either. Um, I think the idea that this can be sort of a, a moving process and it might feel different from day to day as mm -hmm. well. Um, can be really helpful for people, right? Like you might wake up feeling slightly different tomorrow than you 
than you did today and that's okay so meet your body where it's at when you approach playing that day um being able to to build strength in certain areas to have the endurance of your muscles to support yourself playing as long as you need to play i think is really important too so you know if you are someone that needs to be playing for two hours two and a half hours at a time or or something like that um almost the idea of training for that to make sure that you have the ability to to sustain your yourself mm -hmm. is, is i think a really good um principle as well um I think giving yourself breaks too, both during practicing and then also even during rehearsals. So in orchestra rehearsals, I know there's oftentimes a feeling that you need to be like ready to go all the time. Well, maybe you right. just gently let things relax or gently stretch a little bit side to side or kind of move out of the position that you're in all the time to help find some balance there, right? So if we're, in a position for too long, if we can get ourselves out of that and kind of gently reverse that for a small period of time, maybe throughout rehearsal, maybe throughout your practice session, just through generally throughout your day, um, we're gonna be able to balance out those, those imbalances that are occurring because of the occupation that you have. Yeah, that reminds me that I, I think all of these questions of just physicality, it's, it's inexorable from the music you're making. I think and that's something I discovered it's like when I when I discovered that I was too rigid in, in my sitting then I started giving myself instructions on like just making sure I move around a bit and what I realized is that that's I can actually connect that to the music and lo and behold like many great chamber musicians when I watch them like the phrase takes their body a certain way and like this is part of music making and I think the connection between that and just the, the pure physiology is, is important. Um, so once I started to allow a phrase to, to, to move my body a certain way, it just really freed up that rigidity. Um, so Absolutely. That, yeah. we, are, we are mobile beings, right? We are mobile supposed beings. to move, and our body likes to move. So absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So is there anything else you want to show on this um, app? Or... Um, let me just because otherwise we can kill, um, kill yeah, the screen. Yeah, no, sorry, sure. I'll close this down. Um, no worries. There's, I think it's just important to know sort of like where where are our nerves, right? Yeah. Our nerves do a lot of things for us. Um, really important things for us, right? They allow us to feel things. They allow us to have all of that fine motor precision. They allow our, our muscles to have um, to, to be able to move, right? That's that's our connection. And um, so I think it's important to understand where they are just a little bit and how many things are on top of them as well. Mm. Um, so we have right kind of here, we have this like really lovely nerve complex and nerve bundle that kind of sits right under your collarbone, right? And um, from there, right, that comes from nerves in the spine, comes down this way, big complex here. And then all of those nerves branch off and travel down to supply all of the muscles in your upper arm, your forearm, your wrist, and your hand. Um, so knowing that, right, knowing that they start here in your neck, um, there's a there's a lot of places down the chain that they could maybe get um, irritated or um, kind of trapped in different ways um, based on muscle tightness, based on what we do with our bodies, based on the positions that we're in mm -hmm. all day long. So just, I think it's important to know kind of where those come from and kind of then if we, right, like put all of the muscles back on, right, um, they're really kind of deep down sometimes, right? I would say our ulnar nerve is probably the most superficial one and you can sometimes feel that one like kind of right on the side by your funny bone. Um, so that's so that's what when you hit it that's what kind of gives the right and get that little tingling. shock yeah. kind of zinger feeling um absolutely but uh yeah so i mean lots to talk about there but well so uh, something i noticed when you were showing the nerves like and you were mentioning just this big meeting place right here and i find that some of these big meeting places of nerves is often where we have problems of like constraint like as violinists like i think there's some kind of pinching i don't know if pinching is the right word but um, I think that's a lot, a lot of the problems we deal with, like, even if we're, let's say, loose here, um, sometimes uh, I have students actually that have had hand numbness just because of so much 
that's happening here that's not good. And like you were mentioning how something over here is actually connected to something all the way over there. Um, so I think maybe you could correct me on this if I'm wrong, but like that the, that gathering of nerves there becomes a very um, uh, sensitive place because if, if that's pinched, that just like everything that comes from it is going to be affected. Absolutely. And that's that's one of the things that happened to me, right? So mm. um, this kind of triangle right here, ooh, I think I can even draw, um, sort of through here is mm. called your thoracic outlet. Um, and again, aside from that really important nerve complex called your brachial plexus, um, you also have arteries, right? Vessels that go through that area as well. So um, absolutely, if that is getting a little bit compressed because you have a lot of muscle tension coming through there, um, or because maybe you know your shoulder has been so far forward because of maybe playing in certain positions or just doing what you need to do throughout your day that you're actually shutting that down. You mm -hmm. can get symptoms all the way down, down into the hand as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, all right, I'll stop sharing this. Cool. Um, let me just get our screen back here. So one of the other things I wanted to ask you about is more specifically, I know you didn't want to do too many specific exercises because, of course, it's so personal, but um, some of the things you showed me when I was in Colorado were just so helpful, like, very basic things with with the foam roller. So I'm wondering if you can talk about just some of the tools that are out there that people can try um, and kind of what are the main, maybe from a violinist's point of view, the main things we can we can target with those tools. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things I touched on earlier was kind of the idea that we need to get out of the position that we're in as, as the musician or do, playing the music that you do, right? So um, for a violinist right so dan get into your like you're not you don't have a violin with you but like get into your position just like <laughs> or of course you do. Ta -da. okay so let's let's see. just pretend you're kind of like about to play or something like that um mm -hmm. right and then like where's your bow or maybe you're like on i don't know take a swing uh, beyond somewhere if i must <laughs> yes. I i'm so needy Cool. And you don't, again, you don't have to actually play, but just kind of like put your, put your hand on the string, kind of like put, get, get yourself ready to go. Yeah. Great. So for a lot of violinists, right, that right arm is, is maybe a little bit forward. Our chin and head are kind of down this way, turned to the side a little bit. Um, and then your left arm is oh, like for the majority of time, your elbow is going to be bent and you're in this sort of, um, one sec, supinated position with this left mm -hmm. arm and like this pronated position with the right arm. Right. So we kind of have these opposite things going on. And you're also, also a little, this, Yes, exactly. And right. Your elbow so much of this. Yeah. Right. Your elbow is really close to your body. So right. um, and then are you rotated at all? Like, do you rotate your spine a little bit there, too? Yeah, you can. Exactly. Exactly. I, I used to do more of that. And it was a big problem. Like, I'm, okay. yeah, I'm trying to be a little more. <laughs> and it it's taken a long time to really realize that, like, these things are. But yeah, there was. I mean, all of school. Yeah. It was, it was, it was no, this. absolutely. <laughs> um, exactly. So I think um, when I see that, right, I think, okay, we really need to open through the front of your shoulders and we need to open your chest and we need to get your head and neck out of that position that it's in every single day, hmm. right? So um, with Dan and with my husband, um, I've been working on some things of like opening the chest. So foam rollers are really nice. They're like these giant pieces of foam. They're like a cylinder and you lay on them and you can do, oh, perfect. Dan's got all the things. Um, yes. <laughs> and so you can do a variety. I went of things out and on got that. one right after we did our <laughs> exercises. Excellent. Um, so I love that for many reasons, right? It When you're lying on it, it's an unstable surface. So you have to activate your core. Um, yeah. As you're lying on it, it gives you some gentle pressure through your spine and the muscles that are connected on either side of your spine coming all the way down. As you move your arms, you're also getting input into your shoulder blades, which help to support your arm movement, right? And then you're also able to kind of stabilize and put your neck and head in a neutral position. So we're just sort of neutralizing everything compared to what you have to do for playing the violin. Um, we can stretch out through the front of the shoulders there. Um, we can, again, do some core stabilization exercises, some um, head and neck work there too. Um, so lots of things with that. Uh, and just, so that's, that's, just so that's clear, yeah. like that the, the foam roller is like 
vertically, basically parallel along, yeah, parallel. And then the head should be also resting, like it shouldn't be. And rest it. on. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And then it kind of ends somewhere close to the, the base of your spine. Yeah, like your tailbone, your tailbone and your head should both be supported. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um so i yeah i love that tool i think it's great you can also put it the other way right and kind of mobilize your thoracic spine a bit in some different ways so it can be a really helpful tool if you have guidance again to just do all these things safely for your body yeah. um but again a lot of times we end up with a lot of tension too right through our thoracic spine through the upper back um because your arms are just lifted and you're working your shoulders so hard all day long so if you can find ways to move that area too maybe it's seated right maybe you're just doing some like gentle seated thoracic twisting here side to side um one of my favorite exercises is called this open book exercise where you're seated or you're lying down on your side and just twisting one way or another and it allows you to twist and bring your whole head and neck yeah. with you right again opening the shoulder getting movement through the upper back and then also moving your head and neck to both sides right like let's try to even that out because you <laughs> y'all are always yeah, this is, this is a very direction. foreign feeling right here. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, yes. So yeah, I think those are great like mobility options. Um, you know, self-massage tools can be really helpful too. So the foam roller can be used as like a self-massage tool, but also things mm -hmm. like theracanes, tennis balls. Um, I've even had people use like, you know, linens or lines or things like that. Like whatever you really have at home that can be helpful. Um, Cause you will end up with kind of some balls of muscle tension. It's it's the nature of what we do. Um, but if we have tools again, to, to kind of get in there and break some of that up, sometimes it can be helpful. Um, you know, people are using a lot of massage guns these days. I find them a little bit intense kind of on these areas here. I use them more for like leg muscles and things like mm. that. Um, what else? Taping. I tape my husband a lot. We use kinesio tape. Um, Starting with the mouth, right? Correct. Just get it all off. Um, <laughs> but it can be really nice because uh, the tape that I use is like an elastic tape. So it's it's supposed to move with you. So it's not restricting you in any way or holding you in any way. It's just a nice um, guidance and kind of feedback mechanism to like help help your muscles do what they're, they need to do during your day. So it's kind of one of these things we've found at least for him that can help him get through a really long work week right if he's feeling a little bit of something um so whether it's on the shoulder or the scapula the shoulder blade or maybe on the forearm um yeah that's another kind of option that people have so just kind of to, to, to clarify regarding the tape for people that don't know uh, yeah. anything about how that tape works so it, it basically like creates a certain tug in a way that reminds you to move and engage the body a certain way or, or how would you describe yeah, it? Yeah, I would say it's just sort of giving giving certain muscles um, feedback in and kind of assistance um, in helping you do what you need to do with your body. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, sometimes I'll use it like just gently facilitating our shoulders or our shoulder blades, like pulling back, right? Again, to sort of open through the chest or um, helping on the forearm. Sometimes my husband will say that like his grip feels really weak on his bow arm. And so I'm just going along basically the direction of the muscle fibers to facilitate the action that I want. Um, I that can be something that can be taught to people, right? I mean, I've taken some classes on kinesio taping. There's a lot of thoughts about like, well, you should really be trained. To do this i think if you can learn a good technique that works for you i would be happy to teach it to you so you can have it in, a, in your toolbox to use so yeah yeah something that i i worked with with someone on um and you mentioned like using some tennis ball or something so i have some of the cross balls and mm -hmm. what was really helpful for me was when i was shown just how to manipulate your weight with some of these tools to you know to activate certain to create certain pressure points, you know, without risking any injury or something like, so it is a, it is a matter of kind of practicing and um, like playing an instrument, just finding ways to, <laughs> to use your body weight effectively and safely to kind of optimize these tools. Also with the Absolutely. foam roller, like certain angles and all yes. that stuff. <laughs> Definitely. It definitely takes time to figure out how to use them. And again, to find the ones that are going to work for you. Right. So yeah. I suggested foam roller to you because I thought it might be helpful, but it may not have been right. We're all, we're all different and we're all going to have tools 
that work best for us. But it's it's important to kind of take the time and find what those are again to kind of keep yourself keep yourself going. And I'll say that too about providers. Like let's say you do decide to go out and you want to f- seek out a physical therapist or someone. You know that first person may not. You know, maybe you have a bad experience that may not be the only person out there, right? And just like we search really hard for like a teacher to be our guide, right? Right. PTs are partners in in this uh, rehab process, right? So I am not here to dictate and tell you what to do as a patient. Like I am joining you in this process. I want to learn about your goals, learn about like you're the expert on your body, you're the expert on the violin. I am here to support you in that. So a, a good physical therapist, a good rehab professional will be able to do that for you and should be able to, to look at what you need to do as a violinist, look at your goals, look at your body, analyze your movement and really kind of go on that journey with you. But it may not be perfect the first time. So like patience mm. with that, I think is really important too, right? You may have started feeling things like 20 years ago, right? Because we've all been playing for a very, very long time. So that thing may not go away in like two sessions. Right. Of well, it's like therapy. You finally decide to go, right? It's like therapy so, of, of all kinds. Time. It's like time. Yeah. Yes. Right. So we got to give it that time too. And that's that's the same, I think, for, for exercises or tools that we might choose to use too, right? Yeah. yeah. What are your thoughts on like chiropractors? And because I know some people that are like really into that. And uh, I've actually never gone myself to like get adjusted. It's enough for me to watch the YouTube videos with what I think are fake sound effects. I'm not sure. Um, have you seen the guy that adjusts animals? Like he adjusts horses. It's, it's insane. And he has a YouTube channel. Like I can't tell if it's like, I think it's fake, but like he's really serious. And then goes, Psh! and then the horse, like big crack. And the horse is like, what's going on? Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, uh, really good question. Again, I think uh, there are a lot of really, really good rehab professionals out there. And I'll say there's absolutely some good chiropractors out there. And if that's something that, again, works for you, and if it's a tool that you think is helpful and um, can find one that you trust, again, who can be a partner in your rehab journey or in your maintenance journey, um, I think I think that's fantastic. Um, I will say one of the differences that just with the chiropractors I've experienced they don't always have as much of an understanding of the um, therapeutic exercise component of rehab. And I think that's one of the most important things that you can learn because that's something you can do yourself, right? Yeah. Um, as a physical therapist, I, am, I empower my patients. That, like you are ultimately going to treat yourself, right? I'm gonna give you the tools. I can do some manual therapy if I need to. I have certain things I can do to you, but ultimately, you're taking this on, it is an active rehab process. And I, just the chiropractors I've experienced don't have maybe as many tools of that nature. And so you're always having to go back to get that adjustment or to get that um, that treatment done. And again, that's just the right. ones I've experienced. So. And so with, is, is there a particular order that you'd recommend? Like, should someone see a physical therapist first maybe, or is it is that also really depend yeah, I do, I do think it depends. I think um, physical therapists really can be primary care workers in musculoskeletal conditions. Mm-hmm. So in all states now, we have some form of what's called direct access. So you can access a physical therapist without going to your physician first. Mm-hmm. Um, these rules are, are slightly different in each state, but you can do that legally and they are there to support you in that. So, um, you know, we can treat musculoskeletal conditions, neuromuscular conditions, and we can also screen for other things that might be going on that may warrant a referral to a physician, to a neurologist. Um, Here in Colorado, I can refer for imaging, right? I can refer for x-rays and MRIs. Um, So there's a lot of things that physical therapists can do and you might have easier access to us than going to a physician first sometimes and then kind of coming, coming down the line. Right. I'm curious, maybe there this does exist, but I don't know of any physical therapy practices that are like in residence in a music school and design mm-hmm. like there for the musicians in some way, shape or form. Does that exist to your knowledge? Um, so I do know there's certain 
I don't think that exists in, to the fullest extent that it could. I think there's maybe like a couple of these really awesome things. Some collaboration. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like in-house. Yes, yes. So oftentimes collaborations, maybe you're at a, a university that also has, um, you know, a really big sports program. So they have a big physical therapy program and maybe there's some cross go between but um, in terms of that. Uh, when I presented down at the Performing Arts Medicine Association conference a couple years ago, I met this team who was a violin instructor and a physical therapist, and they were both at the same university um, in Europe. Again, this was, yeah, so other parts of the world, but um, doing a very cool thing. So this was a violin instructor in his studio who was bringing in a physical therapist, right? Because the idea was this collaboration. Mm -hmm. You are the violin expert, right? I am not gonna tell someone how to specifically change their violin technique that is out of my wheelhouse and I shouldn't be doing that, right? Um, but as the movement expert, right? And as the clinician, I can come in and collaborate, let's say with you, Dan, or with my husband, look at this musician who's playing and you can say, here's what I'm seeing, what are you seeing? And mm -hmm. we can work together on what are the best options for this person um, and kind of come up with a plan from there. So I thought that was, just fantastic. And I think that would be such a cool thing for music schools to have um, on hand, right? Why not? Or orchestras, right? Have that collaboration, have those people, those resources, because we know people are going to get injured, right? Like 90% of student and professional musicians will have a playing related musculoskeletal disorder throughout their career. Mm -hmm. This is, this is known now, right? So like, let's, let's get things out there let's let's do this <laughs> well what, what's interesting to me is that we have some of that in the violin making and violin maintenance or instrument maintenance like some schools have their in-house person that you know anyone can bring their instrument to and definitely in like summer programs that's a common thing like there's a resident expert in in that and I just don't see too much like I see sometimes people are like there's a resident yoga person which is like okay or there's like a com compulsory yoga class or Alexander class, but it, it doesn't seem to have the same treatment as, you know, these slightly more obvious things like instrument, need repair, take to repair person. Like we don't think of our yeah. bodies that way or like knowing how to treat your instrument so it doesn't break. Because often it's like we are, it's a lack of care of the instrument that causes a lot of problems and we learn how to avoid that. And just that same approach to the body doesn't seem to be there quite yet in, in the conservatory setting. I 100% agree, yeah. And I, I think it's it's a great time to start, yeah, again, having these conversations and changing that and really looking towards what could be, right? Yeah. There was, uh, I had an opportunity to speak to some of the students at San Francisco Conservatory of Music when I was in my final year of PT school out in San Francisco. and. Uh, yeah, it was it was this class that they were piloting um, on health and wellness for musicians. So it was it was actually organized by one of the PTs from UCSF who had treated me as a patient, and um, she was bringing in collaborators, right? So other people who had different specialties in different areas of of medicine to kind of like put together this course of um, basic anatomy and physiology. Um, let's talk about the stress response, right? Let's talk about music performance anxiety. Let's talk about these different topics to help you be able to have a fruitful career, right? And I think like that's exactly where it needs to start, right? Let's, let's teach people how to have these tools that they can then take further on. Um, Maybe we could yeah. talk a bit about the, like the anxiety and like the st stress response and like the, the things you mentioned. Um, you were showing me some some materials earlier that I thought were very interesting on that topic. So, yeah, yeah I'm curious, like where that intersects. Mm. Yes, this is a topic that's very close to my heart. Um, let me pull this up real quick. Do are we good on time too? Yeah, yeah, we have some time. Yes. So, um, uh, where are we? Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Um, so yeah, a topic that's very close to my heart. I actually did my, 
uh, PT dissertation on music performance anxiety. And I was looking at what could we as physical therapists do for the symptoms of music performance anxiety. I was also looking at what's the likelihood that having music performance anxiety and performing with a higher level of stress could lead to a musculoskeletal disorder, mm -hmm. right? If we're playing with more tension, if we're playing with um, just more kind of doubting thoughts going on in our mind, right? And and this being a really important topic. Um, so just like, I'm curious even for people, if, if you wanna throw into the chat, just things that you've experienced maybe with music performance anxiety in any of these different categories, right? Physical symptoms, emotional symptoms, maybe cognitive symptoms, right? We've all had that moment where we like just completely lose track of where we are maybe and can't go on, right? Yeah. Um, behavioral symptoms, anything like that. And yeah, Dan, like, what, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this too. Yeah, I mean, this is this is something I've struggled with quite a lot and gotten a lot better with. But um, I mean, for for me, it was it was always tied to like the fact that I started late, and that created a lot of kind of psychological I don't know about issues, but it's something I had to contend with, and it was always there, staring at me, like, you know, ha have I caught up? Am I behind? Um, and I've you know. I think I've moved beyond that, but for, for many years that was, um, and that would affect me physically when I played, you know, and then, um, like I mentioned to you, like when we were talking about breathing and just priming the body and like this cycle that one can go through, when I didn't do that and then the body just reacted in an unfavorable way at a certain point, it's just, it's too late. And like the first 30 minutes of the concert are gonna be rough. And then if I can manage Maybe I can get things down, but um, yeah, that was um, <laughs> was a whole whole journey. But yeah, no, and I think it's a journey for a lot of people. Absolutely. And it's one of those things that I think is absolutely still stigmatized, right? No yes. one talks about it, right? In the performing world, right? You're just expected that like you have a way of dealing with it. You're not going to talk about it. And you're just going to go up on stage and do what you're supposed to do. Um, yeah, I mean, it, I can speak from my from my personal experience mm -hmm. too i think uh throughout my rehab journey right if that had been one of the components that was maybe more addressed right because i was putting so much pressure on myself to get back to where i was and all of that fear and kind of mental thoughts of like i'm losing time i haven't practiced yes. or played for three months and i need to be at this level when i go back and these are the expectations oh my gosh, right? Like, it's just overwhelming yeah. um, how fearful you can become of that, right? And I think for people also who are having maybe some kinds of physical symptoms, and I know this was true for my husband too, um, as he started feeling more tired um, during certain weeks of playing with the orchestra or feeling more sore, it would backfire. It was like, okay, I don't know if there's something going wrong. I don't know if I can trust my body to be able to put out the kind of music standard that mm. I'm supposed to. And it becomes a cycle, right? So if you can't trust your body to do what it's supposed to do with this thing that you've practiced so hard on, um, then you start doubting yourself. And then your heart rate starts can start rising, right? And then you're not breathing well. And then all of a sudden you just, it's a cycle. Um, yeah. So again, I think just if we can talk about it more and know that it's a normal thing, we all deal with it, right? And um, what can we do for it, right? And let's give even our students some resources to to help with that. It seems so, like uh, historically, it's like there's a self-selective kind of aspect to this that it wasn't really talked about. And, but the people for whom it worked out, like, you know, their names and like the people that don't, you don't. and it just doesn't seem on the surface that there was this big problem because there was a self-selective process there. But now, you know, when people are talking about it, we realize how many people struggle with this. And even the people that are successful, maybe it's not sustainable success. Or like I see some like really famous violinists playing. I'm like, I don't think that's going to work for another 10 years. Like I'm looking at some... Looking at some of these people, um, but Kavakos has yeah. proved us all wrong. Well, and again, it's not, you can't always see it, right? That's um, right. But yeah, so here, I mean, just like, 
you know, some, some stats about music performance yep. anxiety, and it just like can really impact someone's quality of life. So beyond the fact that maybe it's impacting, you know, your performance ability, but it's having a huge effect on people's quality of life. Um, you know, large rates of depression and anxiety, things like that. And I'm, I'm not a, a psychologist or a therapist in any way, shape or form, but, um, what I was realizing during my research is that these are things that we can have an impact on as physical therapists. So maybe, um, your PT can just give you like a tiny little hint of some things and then absolutely go, go seek out, um, more help for that. Also, if that is something that's, that's needed. Um, I found but, that for, for myself, just yeah. off of what you said, like certain physical directions I gave myself, like certain awareness led to me like trying certain things, certain things physically that actually changed my psychology. Like if something worked physically, it, it, there, there's something so tangible about it when something works that it can free you psychologically and it could kind of um, declog certain certain pathways. Yeah. So it's so connected. I, if we feel good, if we trust ourselves, if we trust our body and we're feeling strong, oh, things go so yeah. well, right? Um, but some of the things that I found in my research just that that we as physical therapists could be doing for this and just what was what was being done for people who were having music performance anxiety and struggling with that. And um, so I just, I stole some of these slides from my previous presentations, but um, lots of good options here, right? So mindful movements, right? So that maybe that's yoga, maybe that's Tai Chi, Pilates, um, learning about Alexander technique, stuff like that. Again, you're gonna find the thing that works works for you, right? Yeah. Um, having really good breathing techniques. I think this idea, right, of biofeedback training, if we can really learn to control how high our heart rate rises as we get stressed or how we can control our breathing um, and help our body relax and what that feels like to be able to have control over that when we're playing, I think is is um, a really big, big thing there too. Uh, mindfulness, I'm a, I'm a huge uh, uh, encourager of, of using that as well. Um, yes. And then, yeah, just body awareness, right? So as physical therapists, that's something that we help our patients with all the time, right? If I can just help you know, you th you might think you're straight up right now, but actually your head is cocked to the side, right? Or um, you think you're standing straight up, but actually you're leaning really far forward, right? Those small things of like, let's gain just awareness on like where we are in space, right? Um, yeah, I had a very kind of visceral experience with that when I was working with a student and she yeah. was like very, very tense, just like, I'm no physical therapist, but like, I feel like anything I could suggest could, could, have, could have been helpful. And so one of the things we looked at was just, you know, hold your violin up. And we did that for like five minutes and, and immediately put it down. And then I had, it was kind of a class setting. People look at her level of her shoulders and it was like this. And she thought she was relaxed. Yeah. And then we got her to the People point of this and she actually started crying. Like, yeah because it was like, oh, wow, like I didn't even realize. And yeah. Yes. Crazy. Right, and that it can have a, a very emotional and visceral response sometimes too. Like when people first learn to sort of use all of the room that they have to breathe fully, mm. that can also just uh, really change how the nervous system is working for people too. Um, but one of the things on here too that I love is just, again, this discussion and education piece, right? So, and I think that goes for injury prevention overall, but also for music performance anxiety, again, just talking about these things, bringing awareness to them, right? And then starting to figure out like, what can we do better, right? We can do better. We can give students more education on this stuff. We can talk about it more like we're doing now, right? We can create classes on this topic, right? Like let's use the resources that we have and collaborate with each other. Again, I think more collaborations between uh, healthcare providers and musicians, right? Healthcare providers in general have a lot to learn about the stress of being a musician, right? Both on your body and then also psychologically. So I think the more, yeah, the more collaborations there are. The better. Yeah, it seems like there are these silos and like yeah. silos of specialization. And then this, this is a problem in other fields as well that, that there isn't yes. enough collaboration, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. So we had one question um, that I wanted to get to. We had a, um, 
forgot who it was from, but she was asking kind of how do you, like if you're getting older and maybe you're dealing with some arthritis or like pre-arthritis, um, obviously, as you mentioned, it's, it's all very personal approach, but how do you deal with you know, keeping keeping mobility as you get a bit older and um, like what you talked about with awareness and, you know, just being able to play uh, for, for a bit longer. Yeah, so that's, I think that's a, it's a challenging question. It's a really, really good one though, because we all do hope to have really long careers, right? Um, I think finding again, those tools that you can use that are really gonna work for your body. So. Uh, maybe there's certain exercises or like literally mobility exercises for your hands, for your neck, for your shoulders um, to help you feel less stiff. Maybe you figure out a warm up regimen, right? Where I'm not talking about like playing scales on the instrument, but um, maybe you walk, right? Get some cardiovascular exercise in the morning, get that blood circulating, um, and then you do like some wrist or hand exercises nerve glides, keep up their strength um, to support your joints. And then also, again, just keep things moving. And I think that's keep things moving on the right on the music side, but also on the other side, right? So that idea of, of balancing these things out, um, finding kind of a regular routine to keep your body healthy and feeling as best as it can. Um, and then I would also say, like, Again, going to going to a physical therapist, yeah. uh, not to like self promote my profession, but I really do think that those are times when we can be really helpful, really helpful. Cause then we can, we can look at the arthritis piece, but then we can also, our job is to help you move optimally in your body, right? Dealing with whatever it is that you're dealing with to be able to do what you want to do for as long as you can with as little pain as possible. Right. So mm. that's, uh, that's the whole goal. Yeah. And uh, it's like a whole world yeah. that opens up. I think like if you're not aware of this and you go to a physical therapist, there's just so much valuable information that can be conveyed and just, I mean, obviously you can go on YouTube and like look at exercises for this. And you know, that, that has been helpful for me, but only after I kind of saw a professional and um, had some foundation of just how to go about it, how to think of assessing ex an exercise that I see, like, is it good for me or not? You know, and as you said, like we become our own teachers and like the, you, you are plugging your, your industry, but you're also, planning its obsolescence um, at the same time. Like you, you want to not be needed, yeah. <laughs> 100%. so to speak. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's really great too, to think about this, like where, you know, where will our bodies be in like 20 years or so, you know, and kind of make plans. We'll be in the be cloud. Okay, right. <laughs> but like be okay with the fact that like, yeah, we may feel things in 10 years that we didn't feel now. So also like those tools and the resources that you're using will have to change and adapt with with your body, right? And maybe you never before needed to like play with gloves on for the first couple of minutes that you play, but maybe now like your hands are just so so cold or it feels good to have things warmer, right? I don't I don't know. Then maybe there's, you know, things that you figure out um, yeah. that are gonna help you do what you need to do. Um, I think, yeah, we can always, you know, always think of like nutrition and fuel as well for for playing and performing. Um, and again, that absolutely will change too, right? As we grow and change right. and our lifestyle changes too. Um, so looking at those kinds of things to promote joint health, nerve health, um, healthy muscles, um, all of that as well. Um, I'm curious like what you have going on now, uh, anything coming up, any presentations or um, stuff you're doing at the, at the clinic? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, unfortunately, the clinic I work at now has nothing to do with this topic that we've right, right, but... <laughs> been discussing. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, I'm I'm hoping to get my board certification in orthopedics um, at the end of February. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's just really helped me kind of hone in on my skills and my clinical knowledge and my clinical reasoning surrounding musculoskeletal conditions and kind of put that together even further with then my my background in music so i'm really excited um to go forward and put these things together um yeah hoping hoping to do more with you dan and uh and you're working with the symphony a bit a as well too. yeah and you... yeah treating um a few folks from the symphony right now and trying to 
be more of a resource for them as well, um, hoping to collaborate in some way, maybe in the future, um, and just really be there to provide education where I can. Again, I think people don't always use the resources that are around them, but I also am finally kind of feeling ready in my career to, to put myself out there as a resource. So that took me some time too, I think, to just, you know, get confident in your in your skills as a clinician and also start piecing together like really where what the possibilities are and where you want to go with this so uh yeah well you're you're an excellent resource and um yeah just uh, i think i think it's been very enlightening to to chat and just it puts a lot of pieces into a more cohesive place a lot of things that maybe we feel intuitively like something ain't right but you just mm -hmm. you don't have the words or the information or the anatomy and uh, the knowledge of anatomy and um, so yeah thank you for for being a good resource on that and uh, where can people find you you are going to yes. broadcast uh, everything can I put that up there? Um, I'm going to share my screen one more time is it okay oh yeah yeah let's just do that sure um, oh yeah I had this other slide here I just through up now but um if anyone wants to like take a picture of that just like some other things to to think about when we're considering this i'm hoping to have more conversations about these things in more detail maybe at some point oh yeah um, we should we'd love so, to uh, have you back on for that Definitely. yeah and then um this page too i put together just some resources for musicians um this is like research that's happening this is uh places you can go maybe to to find providers in your area mm -hmm. right if you are needing treatment um yeah just a lot of a lot of groups doing a lot of things so um take a look at those and then here is me uh again i'm happy to talk to anyone about any of this and be a resource as needed i can maybe try and connect you with someone in your area as well if you're really actually needing treatment but um please feel free to reach out yeah <laughs> awesome well emily thank you so much for for talking with me and for for sharing this and it's just it's always good to to catch up and um, it's been amazing to, to see kind of where you've, where you were, where you, and where you are now and where, can only imagine where you will be with, with all of this. And it, yeah, I'm just really excited, uh, really excited to have you on. So thanks for, for coming on to Tone Base and, um, yeah, until next time. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dan. And for everyone who, who was, uh, who was listening, this really was a lot of fun and it, it